Hi guys, welcome to this Easy Maths video and today we are looking at questions 21 to 25 from the 2017 Intermediate Maths Challenge. Question 21, Brachycephalus frogs are tiny, less than one centimetre long and have three toes on each foot and two fingers on each hand, whereas the common frog has five toes on each foot and four toes on each hand. Some Brachycephalus and common frogs are in a bucket each frog has all its fingers and toes. Between them, they have 122 toes and 92 fingers. How many frogs are in the bucket? The answers is A is 15, B is 17, C is 19, D is 21, and E is 23. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down how many toes and fingers a Brachycephalus frog should have and a common frog should have. So a Brachycephalus frog, right up here, fingers and toes. Well, we're told they have three toes on each foot, so that's going to be six toes for each frog, and then two fingers on each hand, so that's going to be four fingers for each frog. Now on the common frog. has five toes on each foot, so it's going to be a total of ten toes, and four fingers on each hand, so that's going to be a total of eight fingers. Okay, and we know that between both of the frogs there's a total of 122 toes and 92 fingers, and we need to work out how many frogs are in the bucket. Okay, so we obviously know it's going to be between two different species, the Brachycephalus frog or the common frog. Now, we don't know how many of each species of frog there are in the bucket, so what we can do is if we represent the Brachycephalus frog with the letter B and the common frog with the letter C, then we should be able to form two equations and then solve them simultaneously based on the number of toes and the number of fingers. So a Brachycephalus frog has four fingers, so we do 4B, and a common frog has eight fingers, so that's plus 8C. And that's equal to a total number of fingers of 92. Now for the number of toes, it's going to be 6B plus 10C equals 122. Okay, so now we've got two equations. We just need to work out what the value of B and C is by solving them simultaneously, adding them together, and then we'll get the total number of frogs in the bucket. So I can do this by the process of elimination. So I can multiply this equation through by 6 and this equation by 4. So that will cancel out the b's. So this first equation multiplied by 6, that's going to be 24b plus 48c. And then 6 times 2 is 12. 6 times 90 is 540. So it's going to be 552. And then 4 times 6 is 24b plus 10 times 4 is 40c. And that's equal to 122 times 4, so that's going to be 2 times 4, which is 8, 20 times 4, which is 80, so it's going to be 488. Okay, so now we can eliminate the B's, the B terms by doing equation 1, subtract equation 2. So we're going to get 8C equals 552 minus 488, so if I work that out here, get 12 minus 8 is 4, carry the 1 from here, so we get 14 minus 8 is 6, so yeah, we get 64, and then if we divide both sides by 8, we get C equals 8. Okay, and then to find B, we just need to substitute C equals 8 into either one of these two equations, so I'm going to use the first equation, so we're going to get 4B plus 8 times 8, which is 64, equals 92, we're going to subtract 64 from both sides. That gives us 4b equals 28, then divide both sides by 4, we get b equals 7. So that means there's 8 common frogs in the bucket and 7 brachycephalus frogs. So there's a total of 8 plus 7, which is 15. So it should be 15 frogs. And we've got an answer of 15, which is answer A. So therefore, final answer equals A.
Question 22, the diagram shows an arc PQ of a circle with centre O and radius 8. Angle QOP is a right angle. The point M is the midpoint of OP and N lies on the arc PQ so that MN is perpendicular to OP. Which of the following is closest to the length of the perimeter of triangle PNM? The answers is A is 17, B is 18, C is 19, D is 20 and E is 21. Okay, so let's annotate this diagram. So we're told that we've got an arc PQ that has a radius of 8. So the length OQ is going to have a length of 8. And then we're told that M is the midpoint of OP. So O to M is going to have a length of 4. And M to, M, M to P is going to have a length of 4. We need to work out the perimeter PMN which is this shape here. And then we've got one of the lengths, we've got P to N, but we don't have P to N or M to N. Now we can easily work out what M to N is, because if I draw a line from O to N, then O to N is the radius of my arc. So this is gonna have a length of A. And of course, we're told in the question that the length of M to N is perpendicular to O to P. Well. And we can easily see that. So this is a right angle. So now you should be able to see that we've got another right angle triangle inside the arc with a base of 4 and a hypotenuse of 8. So we can work out the height of this triangle by using Pythagoras. So the way we do that is we're trying to find mn. And that's equal to the square root of 8 squared minus 4 squared. Okay. And that simplifies to 64 minus 16. And that's the same as saying the square root of 48. Okay, I'm not going to simplify root 48 as a third. So we've worked out the length of mn, which is root 48. Now we need to work out the length of pn. Well, pn is very easily. We don't need to do any calculations. You should be able to see that the triangle... P and M is the same as the triangle O M N. Okay, they're the exact same because they've got the exact same base, the exact same height, so it means that they're going to have the exact same hypotenuse. So the length P N is going to be eight. Okay, so now with all of our lengths, we need to look at each of these answers and see which one is closest to the length of the perimeter of the triangle P N M. Of course, root forty eight does not simplify to a whole number. Okay, and the reason why I haven't simplified it as a third is because I know that the square root of 49 is equal to 7. So that means the square root of 48 is just a little bit less than 7. So what that means is I can approximate root 48 as 7. So in other words, I can round it up to 7. And now my total perimeter is going to be 7 plus 8 plus 4. So 8 plus 4 is 12, 12 plus 7 is 19, and that is my total perimeter. I've got an answer for that, which is answer C. So therefore, my final answer is C. Question 23. Two brothers and three sisters form a single line for a photograph. The two boys refuse to stand next to each other. How many different lineups are possible? I've got answers as A is 24, B is 36. C is 60, D is 72, and E is 120. Okay, so for this question, we need to figure out all the different possible scenarios for the two brothers not standing next to each other and then the three sisters standing in the queue. So there's five people in total, so we've got five places, and we've got to make sure that the two brothers aren't standing next to each other. So for our first scenario, we could have brother one here, first sister here, second brother here, and then the other two sisters can be standing next to each other here. So that's the first scenario. Second scenario could be this. So the brothers are two spaces away from each other. The third scenario, you could have the two brothers being three spaces away from each other. But then we could also have the first brother in the second position and the second brother in the fifth position. And we could also have this. Now we've got one, two, three, four, five. Are there any other possible situations we could have? 
Well, we could have a sister here, a brother here, a sister here, the brother there, and then another sister there. And I think that's all the possible scenarios that you could have. And we've got to work out the total number of different ways that they can stand together in this line. So if we look at the first situation and we concentrate on the brothers, well, it doesn't really matter what brother sits in this first position, but we know that there's two possible places where they could sit. Then for this sister, there's three sisters, and there's three possible places where this first sister can sit. Now, on the second brother, his first brother has already taken up the first seat, so that means there's only one place where he can sit, which is in that third position. And the second sister, she's got two possible places where she can be. So that's going to be two. And then the last sister, there's only one possible place where she can stand. So that's going to be one. So the total number of permutations, if we like, is going to be two times three times one times two times one. And that's six times two, which is 12. Now, what you should be able to see is that the total number of permutations is going to be the same for each scenario. Because, for example, if we look at the second one, any two of the brothers can stand here, any three of the sisters can stand here. There's two sisters left over, so any two of the sisters can stand here. One brother left, so the only place where the brother can stand is here, and the only place where the last sister can stand is there. So that's 2 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 1. 2 times 3 is 6, and again you get an answer of 12. So we've got six possible scenarios in which they could be standing together in a line, and there's 12 possible permutations. So the total number of permutations altogether is going to be 12 times 6, which is 72. And that's the total number of lineups that are possible. And we've got an answer for 72, which is answer D. So therefore, answer equals D. Question 24. The nth term of a certain sequence is calculated by multiplying together all the numbers of the square root of 1 plus 1 over k, where k takes all the integer values from 2 to n plus 1 inclusive. For example, the third term in the sequence is root 1 plus a half times root 1 plus a third times root 1 plus a quarter. What is the smallest value of n for which for the nth term of the sequence is an integer? We've got answers as A is 3, B is 5, C is 6, D is 7, or E is more than 7. Okay, so yeah, the way in which this sequence works, as shown by the third term in the sequence, which gives us this result here, should be able to see that we get to that result by looking at the first term, which is going to be when K equals 2. Because K takes all the integer values between 2 and n plus 1. Okay, so the first term is going to be the square root of 1 plus a half. The second term is going to be when k is 3. But of course, the sequence is formed by, by multiplying together all the numbers within the sequence. So the first term in the sequence is going to be what we calculated, which was 1 plus a half, and then times 1 plus a third. So that means the third term is going to be what they've worked out there. Okay, but we need to find the smallest value of n for which the nth term of the sequence is an integer. Okay, so the way to think about this is let's write the whole sequence out from 2 to n plus 1. And that doesn't mean we have to write every term. We can simplify it. So our first term is going to be 1 plus a half. I'm going to multiply that by root 1 plus a third. I'm going to multiply that by root 1 plus a quarter. And then what's going to happen is we're going to keep multiplying these terms until we get to, say, n. So we get 1 plus 1 over n. And then our last term we know is going to be 1 plus 1 over n plus 1. Okay, so that's our sequence in a generalised form. Now what I can do is I can simplify each of these terms. So I know that 1 plus a half simplifies to... 3 over 2, I know 1 plus a third simplifies to 4 over 3, I know that 1 plus a quarter simplifies to 5 over 4. Now, 1 plus 1 over n, well, if I rewrite 1 as n over n, then I'm going to get n plus 1 over n. 
and then 1 plus 1 over n plus 1. If I change 1 to n plus 1 over n plus 1, I'm going to get n plus 2 over n plus 1. Right, now you're probably looking at this and thinking, what on earth do I do now? Now we're going to use a formula that is very common from GCSE, which we take to always be true. And you should have seen this before, is that if we take the square root of a times the square root of b, we get the square root of a, b. So we can apply that exact same principle to our sequence. So what that means is, we can put square root over three over two times four over three times five over four times dot, 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 times n plus one over n times n plus two over n plus one. Right, now here comes the clever bit. What's going to happen is when we multiply all of these terms together, you should be able to see, if we look at the first term and the second term, we've got a three here and a three here. So what's happening is we're actually doing three divided by three. So these two terms cancel out. And then if you look at the four, we've got another four here. So these terms also cancel out. And what you'll find is a five will also cancel out with the next term, which is going to be six over five. And then we keep on going. So what's going to happen is this n is going to cancel out. And then that n plus 1 cancels out with this n plus 1. And what happens is this whole sequence converges to the square root of n plus 2 over 2. The question says, what is the smallest value of n for which the nth term of the sequence is an integer? Okay, so this is a formula for the nth term from 2 to n plus 1, but we need to test different values of n. So we can test each of these values of n, 3, 5, 6, 7, and any values more than 7. So if we start with n equals 3, so let n equal 3, we're going to get the square root of 3 plus 2, which is 5, 5 divided by 2, 5 divided by 2 is not an integer. So it can't be n equals 3, so we say that's not an integer. Now, next value of n would be 5. So we say let n equal 5. So that's going to be the square root of 5 plus 2, which is 7. 7 over 2 is also not an integer. Next value of n is going to be n equals 6. So we let n equal 6. And then we're doing the square root of 6 plus 2, which is 8. 8 divided by 2 does simplify, because it's even. And 8 divided by 2 is 4, and the square root of 4 gives us an answer of 2, which is an integer. And that is the smallest value of n, which we've tested for. So our answer must be n equals 6, which is answer C. So therefore... Final answer equals C. Question 25. The diagram shows a circle with radius 2 and a square with side lengths of 2. The centre of the circle lies on the perpendicular bisector of the side of the square at a distance x from the side as shown. The shaded region inside the square but outside the circle has area 2. What is the value of x? Got answers as A is a third of pi plus root 3 over 2 minus 1. Answer B is a third of pi plus root 3 over 4 minus 1. Answer C is a third of pi plus a half. Answer D is a third of pi plus 1. And answer E is a third of pi. Right, okay, so the most important thing to do first is to annotate this diagram. Okay, so we're told that we've got a circle with radius 2. Okay, so it's center is where the perpendicular bisector is from these two points, okay? If you imagine we had a compass at the two points where I've drawn those crosses, if we were to draw a perpendicular bisector from those vertices, it would be up here, and that is exactly where the centre of the circle is. So that is what it's saying. So that is what they mean by the perpendicular bisector. So first we've got a radius of 2. So this length here, is 2. Then we're told we've got a square with side lengths of 2. So this is the square up here. So this length is 2 and this length is 2. So that means the whole area of the square equals 
2 times 2, which is 4. And we know that the area of the shaded region equals 2. I've explained the bit about the perpendicular bisector, and that is a, a distance x from the side of the square. So the distance from the centre to the side of the square is x, and we said that the shaded region has an area of 2, and we need to find the value of x. Okay, so let's zoom in on this diagram a bit more closely. So we know that the total area of this square is 4. And we know that the area of that shaded region is 2. So what I think we can do is we need to form an equation in terms of x for the area of the square. And what we could do is we could divide the square up into separate sections. So if I draw a line, which is basically a chord to the circle, then what we need to do is you should be able to see now that we've got a sector here and a rectangle here. Okay, and we need to find the area, both the sector and the rectangle. Now, one thing I've noticed is where I've drawn the chord, that has a length of 2, because the chord is parallel to the side of the square. So this has a length of 2. And where I've drawn my radius, that has a length of 2. So we should be able to see, so if I draw another radius here, well, this is going to be of length 2. And I've actually got a triangle here now which is an equilateral triangle, because all of my side lengths are of length 2. OK, and with that information, I should be able to find the length of this distance here, the height of the triangle. OK, so if I draw that equilateral triangle down here, I'll say it looks something like that. It's not exact, but it's fine. So we've got side lengths of 2 here. Our height is there, so we can write one here and one here. We've got right angles here. Now we can find the height by using Pythagoras. So that's going to be the square root of 2 squared minus 1 squared, which is root 3. So this height is root 3. And the area is going to be, well, if I take the area of one of the right angle triangles, it's going to be a half times the base, which is 1, times the height, which is root 3. But then I've got two triangles that are the same, so I can just multiply this by two. So I'm going to end up with an area for the equilateral triangle root three. Okay, so now what I've basically done is I've worked out this total area here. Okay, but now what you should be able to see is I can work out what this distance is here. Because the height of the triangle is root three, and then the distance from the centre to the side of the square is x. So this must have a distance of root 3 minus x. And now I can work out the area of this whole rectangle here. So if I write up here, the area of the rectangle is going to be 2 multiplied by root 3 minus x which simplifies to 2 root 3 minus 2x. Now, the only other area I've got to find is this area here, this sector up here. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, if I concentrate on these three points here, you should be able to see that this forms a sector of a circle. And I said that the triangle within this sector is an equilateral triangle. Now what that means is not only are the lengths equal, the angles are equal. So this angle is going to be 60 degrees, this angle is going to be 60 degrees, and so is this angle here. So if I draw the sector down here, that's 60 degrees, and then I've got a radius of 2, so what I can do is I can work out the area of this whole sector and then subtract it from the area of the equilateral triangle that I've just worked out. So remember, the area of the sector is theta divided by 360 degrees times pi r squared. Okay, so theta in this case is 60 divided by 360 degrees multiplied by my radius squared, which is 2 squared, which is 4 pi. And 60 divided by 360 is the same as a sixth. 
So I'm going to get 4 sixths of pi, which simplifies to 2 thirds of pi. That's the area of this whole sector, but to find the area of this sector here, so if I write area of smaller sector, well that's going to be the area of the whole sector I've worked out here, which is 2 thirds of pi, subtract the area of the equilateral triangle, which is root 3. So I'm going to have 2 thirds of pi minus root 3. Now I've got everything I need. I've got the area of the rectangle, which is 2 root 3 minus 2x. I've got the area of the smaller sector, which is 2 thirds of pi minus root 3. And then we know what the area of that shaded region was because we were told it in the question, which is 2. And the total area of the square is 4. So now I can generate a whole equation. So area of the shaded region is 2. Plus, let's take the area of the smaller sector, which is 2 thirds of pi minus root 3. Add the area of the rectangle, which is 2 root 3 minus 2x. And all of this is equal to the total area of the square, which is 4. So now I just need to solve this equation for x. So the minus root 3 and the plus 2 root 3 is going to simplify to root 3. So I can rewrite this as 2 plus 2 thirds of pi plus root 3 minus 2x equals 4. Now what could I do? I could subtract 4 from both sides and then add the 2x to both sides. So I've got x on its own. So that's going to give me minus 2 plus 2 thirds pi plus root 3 is equal to 2x, okay? And now I just need to divide everything by 2 to get x. So I'm going to get minus 1 plus a third pi plus root 3 over 2 equals x. Now let's have a look at my answers. Answer A is a third of pi plus root 3 over 2 minus 1, which is the same as what we've got here. My terms are just in a different order. So it's a third of pi plus root 3 over 2 minus 1 is equal to x. And that's answer A. So therefore, our final answer equals A. Thanks for watching the video guys, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, I've also left a link in the description to my website and you can also check out any other videos from my YouTube channel on this page.